Let me share first with you this scripture from 1st, 2nd Corinthians. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. The sermon title this morning is The Road Goes On. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And we move on. As we will say later in the service, at the closing, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. There was a very famous book written back in the night, late 1970s, I think, called, um, well, I don't know what it was called. <laughs> oh, The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck. How many of you have heard of it? That means you're older. <laughs> it was, in fact, one of the best sellers of all time, and uh, still you can find it uh, in the bookstores and on Amazon. And I think one reason it was so uh, big is because it began with an absolute truth. These simple words. Life is difficult. Not only is life difficult, God knows that life is difficult. And God knows that he sends us into this world where life is difficult. Scott Peck said it's one problem after another that we simply have to overcome, have to face it. Mary said in the newsletter this week, the Central Texas Conference Board of Ordained Ministry decided that I needed another year of learning and training before I could be commissioned as a provisional elder. I was in shock when I heard their verdict, and I am still in shock as I update you. I am profoundly disappointed is about all that I can say. I was not prepared that this might be the outcome, and I am so sorry that I am so sorry is aimed at you because she feels she may have disappointed you. There is no disappointment in this. Uh, this is a bump, and we need to know the difference between a bump and a roadblock. <laughs> Mary has not reached a roadblock. In fact, dear friends, in life, there are only bumps. There are no roadblocks, really. Life moves on. And for someone called to ministry, as Mary is called, there is nothing that can stand in the way. Because if God is for us, Paul tells us, who can be against us? Mary is involved in the most tumultuous and one of the most historic and historically difficult times in the whole life of the United Methodist Church. We have lost a third of our churches in the United States, something like that. In the Central Texas Conference, it's more like half of our churches have wandered away. So that one conference, which is now joining with the East Texas Conference and the North Texas Conference to make one big conference, the Panhandle area, they ended up with, I don't know, was it eight churches or 12 churches? And that's all they had left because there were a lot of country people up there. 
and uh, country people uh, tend to be more conservative than city people. So if there are any country per people listening right now, you need to move to the city because you don't quite know what's going on. You need to catch up. And I, I think as far as Mary uh, learning, learning more, we all know that there are very few ministers anywhere who can function at the level that Mary does in this church. And here's a woman right here who's shaking her head yes. And not long ago, as she was leaving the church, she said to me, you know, that's the best sermon I ever heard in my whole life. So we all know the situation. I want Mary to know the situation. I want Mary to know that these bumps come along and they are going to be there, but they don't need to stop us and they don't need to even slow us down a little bit. Speaking of bumps, in the Whataburger that's close to my house, they must be afraid that somebody is going to drive through there so fast they're going to kill someone. They don't just have a bump, they have a mountain. When you hit it, it really shakes you up. But it just makes you feel better when you get on the other side of it because then the road is smooth, okay? This is what Mary needs to keep in mind. I remember when I was uh, in the ordination process a few years back, <laughs> 40, <laughs> 42, three years ago, I was already here at St. Matthew. I uh, had been here and then going to school. St. Matthew was actually a student charge back then. It's kind of funny. They sent me to St. Matthew and they didn't know a thing about me. All they had was a letter of recommendation from a preacher friend of mine, a Presbyterian preacher. And I said, do you have a church that I could serve while I'm entering the ministry? They said, yes, we do. I said, when would I start? I said, two weeks. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't know whether I was a serial killer or not. I mean, they didn't know anything about me. I could have written that, written that letter. Uh, I did tell them I was a school teacher and they probably realized that most school teachers are not serial killers. <laughs> but they sent me to St. Matthew and they were so glad to have me here because nobody else wanted to come. Not because the people here were not wonderful. They were absolutely lovely and I love them all dearly and most of them are gone now, but I give thanks for them. They're beautiful people but because the church was dying and seemed to have absolutely no future at all. So they were happy to have me here and I was happy as pig in mud. So the setbacks that came to me along the way, I just, I just said what I, want, what I want Mary to say. I'm in ministry. I'm doing it. There was one though that threw me. Uh, when you get through with theology school, um, and it took me a year longer than it should have because I took it slowly because I, I was less interested in theology school than I was in ministry, okay? So I put more of my time here than I did there and uh, just added a year onto it. So that delayed my ordination a little bit. When you get through, you have to go through a, a year of um, a year of training under another minister. It's called a mentoring program. Uh, that's what Mary will begin. She'll begin a mentoring program uh, when she, uh, somewhere, somewhere along the way. And uh, that's what was about to begin that will not begin this, this summer. Uh, it's a mentoring program. And um, there was a fellow, <laughs> they sent me uh, as to be mentored by a young man, he was, I was 42 or three, and he was many years younger than I was. And so that may have been a little intimidating to him. I don't know. Um, I was over at that church, at the early service, and over here for the later service, as I remember it. And uh, he, he and I just could not could not 
get along. Now, he was having serious problems with his church. They sent me into a situation where the preacher was having serious problems with the church, and I think they thought, well, this guy's having a lot of problems. It would be interesting, uh, good for him to be mentoring somebody. Or they might have said, we don't like Max, and we're going to send him in here to make him as miserable as he possibly can. I don't know which it was. But he was in turmoil with his church. His wife was so upset with the church and his church so upset with them that she had even stopped going to church. Now, you know that's not going to work for very long. And, and we, we, we just couldn't, we, could, we just couldn't, couldn't make it together. And right at the end of the first semester, I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. It's a full year thing, two semesters. I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. And uh, I think he thought if I stopped, it might reflect badly on him. He said, well, you have to. I said, I can't. He said, you have to, because if you end this right now, any hope that you have of ordination will be over. I said, that may be but I cannot do this anymore. And I left. I thought he might be right. I thought that any hope I had of ordination, I had just given up. How was I gonna tell this church? And I had made the decision. I guess when I left that place, I was in as deep a despair as I have ever been in in my whole life. Have you ever been in real, real depression where you just absolutely feel immobilized? Someone speaks to you and you hardly have the energy to speak back and you try to cover it up and not let anybody know how bad you're feeling, but you actually feel too bad you can't even pretend well? That's where I was. And when I went to bed that night, I said to God, I said, you're going to have to do something because I can't do anything. I said, you know how down I am. I'm as far down as I have ever been in my life. And I said, you must move. I knew God pretty well. I knew God wasn't going to leave me there. God's never going to leave us. He's always with us. I read about someone who had a near-death experience. And this lady wanted to stay in heaven. She wanted to stay there with the Lord. But she was told, no, you must go back. He said, your life is going to be very difficult. You're going to face some very hard times. But remember this. I am with you and I am watching over you. Let's take that seriously. When Jesus told us, I'm with you always, he's with us always. When we pray, God's going to hear. And when we ask for help, God's going to do something. So, in abject despair and absolute exhaustion, I went to bed that night after my prayer and I went to sleep. And during the night, I had a dream. It's one of those uh, uh, vivid dreams, they call them absolutely clear, feels like you're living it. Although I had never driven uh, an old car like the one I was in. It was a car that looked like it could have been made about the year I was born, the early 40s. And uh, I was driving along this road and the sun was shining. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. I was so happy. 
<laughs> and then I noticed right in front of me, there was winter. I mean, it was, there was just a, 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 a sudden cutoff where it was winter, it was sleet, ice, cold. And I stopped the car and I said to myself, I can't get through that. But then I looked more closely and it was only about 20 feet of winter. Right on the other side, 20 feet away, on the other side of the ice and the snow and all that, the sun was shining and the birds were flying and everything was lovely. I said, well, yes, I can get through that. I'll just put the pedal to the metal and just shoot on through. And that's what I did. And I drove down the road, happy as I could be. And I got up the next morning. I was feeling good because I knew what the Lord was saying to me. <laughs> Whatever you need to get through, just go on through it. Well, I had cut off my internship in halfway through. And when I went back to the powers that be, the folks in charge of the intern program, I said, well, you know, I did complete one semester they said, yes, but not very successfully. I said, I still hope that counts because I'd had to miss the semester after that. And they said, no, we really think you need, a, you need another year. Another year. That would delay my ordination for another year. What was I going to do? <laughs> I said, yep. Where do you send me this time? So this time they sent me to First Methodist in Hearst under Henry Raddy. Had a most marvelous year. Hard year. I was over there for the early service and over here for the 11 o'clock service. My life was completely divided between the two services. That's the way it works. But it was a good year. You know, I wasn't ordained. I came here in 1982, and my ordination was not until 1989. I cannot tell you how embarrassed I was to come before the congregation and say, you know, I've been your preacher all these years, and uh, I'm just about to be ordained. Because, see, you can, do, you can do ministry without being ordained. It doesn't show. You can't look around and say, well, that, that person's ordained. They've got a little halo back there. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> but I was embarrassed. And, they, and then they, you know, I didn't want to remind them that I wasn't ordained yet. But we went ahead and the church mostly showed up for my ordination service down at First United Methodist in Fort Worth, and all was well. And it's been well for a long, long time. It was just a bump. It was very, very unpleasant. But it wasn't a roadblock. The road goes on. I know Mary knows. The road goes on. If God is for you, who can be against you? Are you applying this to any discouragement in your own life? Anything you come up against and say, well, I can't get beyond this. You, you will inevitably get beyond everything because life goes on and the whole trajectory of life is toward victory in Jesus Christ our Lord. We've already got the victory. All we've got to do 
is just keep moving toward it. Mary, our dear Mary, we love you. We give thanks for you today, and we look forward to next week when you will be back with us. And please know, God has called you to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there is nothing in the world that can stop you. Join me in prayer. Dear God of grace and glory, Look upon all of us today and remind us whatever life looks like right now, however we may feel right now, we are on that road to glory. And we are like the tree that's planted by the water. We shall not be moved off of this journey. In Jesus' name, amen.